Welcome, good morning, and thank you for tuning in to this morning's panel as part of the Word on the Street Toronto 2021 Festival, our 32nd annual and second fully virtual. I'm Maya, your host, and we're excited to be presenting Diaspora Dialogues in conversation with Anoushe Rani and John Krizank, a discussion of their new dramatic works in partnership with Diaspora Dialogues. Our accessibility sponsor for this event is House of Anansi. Before we dive into our discussion, we need to recognize the land we occupy. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto, or Tukaranto, is now home to many fir diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honours these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. And just a few announcements before we introduce today's panelists. I mentioned off the top that this is the second virtual Word on the Street Festival in our 32 year history. And that's not strictly true because this year's celebration also includes four days of in-person author signings at local bookstores. We'll be at another story bookshop today and at Page and Panel, the TCAF shop and Queen Books later this week. Check out our website or our Instagram Reels page to see the signing schedule for all the shops. And don't forget to sign up for our upcoming panels. This is the fourth day of our festival, celebrating storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Later today, we will be joined by the KW Writers Alliance for two panels, oral storytelling, a discussion of the relevance of the ancient tradition, and that's at 1 p.m., and writing on reading, writers on reading, sorry, a conversation on how reading shapes a writer's work, and that's at three. All information about our upcoming panels can be found on our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from us, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you can find all the panels from this year's festival. And if you enjoyed today's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. And now I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for this panel, Angela Sun. Angela is a mad, plus size, first generation settler actor, theater creator, producer, writer, and arts administrator of East Asian descent. Her multidisciplinary, multilingual art artistic practice focuses on cultural dissonance and mental health. She is also known for her advocacy for cultural diversity, size inclusivity, and access for the invisible disability community that prioritizes lived experience over expert knowledge. She has worked with many emerging and established artistic organizations throughout her career, and currently serves as the Community Engagement Coordinator at Theatre Pasnerai. Welcome, Angela. It's good to have you here this morning. And you're just muted. <laughs> <laughs> if there is anything that reminds us that we're on a digital platform, it's, it's that. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Uh, thank you so much, Maya, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed panelists. So um, the first panelist is Anush Irani, who was born and brought up in Bombay and moved to Vancouver in 1998. He has published four critically acclaimed novels, The Cripple and His Talismans, a national bestseller, The Song of Kahuncha, which was an international bestseller and a finalist for CBC Radio's Kanda Reads, the Hanu Road, which was nominated for the Man Asian Literary Prize, and The Parcel, which was a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. So his play, Bombay Black, won five Dora Maver Moore Awards, including for Outstanding New Play, and his anthology, The Bombay Plays, The Matka King, and Bombay Black, was a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Drama. Irani's short stories have appeared in Granta and the Los Angeles Review of Books, and his nonfiction has been published in the New York Times. His work has been translated into 11 languages, and he teaches creative writing in the World Literature Program at Simon Fraser University, Vancouver. Hi, Anish. How are you Hello. doing? I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> and our second panelist today is John Krizank, a Canadian playwright, screenwriter, and author. 
He is best known for his unique inventive dramas that involve multiple sets and audience interpretation. While unpolitical on a personal level, Krasank's themes stem from his growing up in a politically aware household. Using political events as a backdrop, Krasank explores the personal reasons behind the public actions of humanity. So welcome both Anush and John. And uh, how are you both doing today? <laughs> Good, excellent. Um, I, whenever I'm on a panel with theater artists and it is early, I always ask how you're doing <laughs> because so much of theater is sort of a, a nighttime based activity. You know, does everybody have their coffees and teas? Is everybody feeling comfortable? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I've been waking up early anyway the past few days, so this is this is okay today. Right, because you're in Vancouver. Um, so it's even cool. earlier. Oh, yeah. Been up at five thirty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, you know, also you both work in other industries as well. You know, Nish, you're very acclaimed, you know, novelist and John, TV, film industry. Um, so sort of related to that, I feel like I just have to um, ask the question that is always on the top of everybody's mind these days, which is how is a pandemic going for you? How, you know, has it affected your work? You know, um, especially as both, you know, folks who are involved with live performance and the theater community, have you been watching digital theater? You know, are you missing or concerned for the live performance industry right now? Um, the, I'll go. Um, the pandemic has been great. I mean, to me, it's just another day in the life of a Canadian writer. You know, I mean, we get up, we sit in front of a computer, and 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 we work. So I, I think it's a shock for people this this life of isolation. But I mean, that's generally uh, my daily routine. You know, uh, aside from you know going out and walking. Uh, you know, getting my 10,000 steps in and, <laughs> you know, uh, I live a very quiet life. So I haven't noticed it. Uh, I, I do absolutely feel the shock of uh, what's this done to the theater community, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm mainly working in television now and, you know, and all actors, I mean, that shutdown was brutal and uh, mm -hmm. I, I, a lot of people have yet to recover from it. And especially in theater, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're, we run the risk of losing our audiences. You know, the surveys show that they don't want to come back yet. So mm. that's kind of scary. Anush, are you feeling the same way? Because I know that um, Buffon actually had a run very, very recently. You know, so you've had that, you've been sort of uh, in the theater environment very, very recently. Yes, I mean, you know, I was in... Bombay when the sort of pandemic uh, broke loose. Uh, we had produced Buffon at the Tarragon in December of November or December of 2019 and then I went to India and I was in Bombay. Now, you know, a pandemic in a city like Bombay where you have 20 million people, uh, it can be quite a, a huge challenge because the idea of social distancing, it doesn't make sense. That model does not work in a city like that. And uh, I, you know, to be honest, at that moment, I wasn't thinking of, of theater mm. uh, because yeah. th there are, there's so much more at stake. Yeah. Um, I, I, for example, you know, in, in Bombay, there were migrant workers in the early days of the pandemic. They were trying to go from, go back home to the villages from the city. And a lockdown had been announced and mm. there was no transport available and thousands of people did not know how to go back home and they didn't have money to survive in the city as well so it was quite brutal to see uh, so much uh, inhumanity during during these early days so you know writing yes it's always there you know we observe uh, as as john mentioned you know isolation is is not new for us that is our essential state um so we are always viewing something through that lens of of observation and and empathy uh, but it was difficult to to watch uh, the many things that were tough to watch and by the time i came back to canada i think india had prepared me for for anything you know coming to vancouver and having so much space 
it it felt uh, much more relaxed um, and and less stressful so we did do buffoon at the arts club during the pandemic yes mm -hmm. but it was great to be back in the theater again even though you know people were masked and it it was hard to get that sense of connection at times because even when people was you know smiling or you know it's so intimate that connection between the performer and the audience but when you're masked you know you you don't know whether they're smiling it doesn't it's hard to say but still it was great to be back in a physical space well thank you both so much and especially thank you anish for that reminder of there being sort of a world outside you know and experiencing the pandemic in many different ways um what i don't tell people very much is that I was actually born in Wuhan. Um, mm. So I have a very intimate connection as I'm sure you can imagine to, you know, what's happening uh, to what's happening right now. And uh, not to do a, a awkward transition, but um, I just want to say as well, congratulations to both of you um, there, you know, we're here, um, Although within this context of pandemic, we are here also in celebration of both of your works. And um, especially, I think, uh, Anush uh, Buffon, uh, it is the first publication of Buffon and yeah. the 40th anniversary edition of Tamara. And, uh, and I just kind of wanted to, you know, get both of your feelings around that. You know, Anish, you uh, are a very prolific author and playwright. Do you still get excited for, for the first publication of a new work? I think so. It's it's always, well, more than excited, I think I would say I, I never cease to be sort of amazed at how something turns up. You know, you start with a blank page. There's, it's not even a blank page. I never stare at the computer in the beginning anyway but this idea of something evolving over time mm. and then actually becoming a sort of physical object in your hand or you know you suddenly have these fantastic performers speaking your lines on stage you have directors involved you create room for other artists to come in i i'm always amazed by that and i celebrate that process that's so interesting and it's also i think you know taking it back to what we just talked about, a lot of the things that I'm missing right now as somebody, you know, very isolated on, on Zoom. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, in contrast, John, it's been 40 years, how does it yeah. feel to, <laughs> sorry, not to date anyone <laughs> here, but how does it feel to be with this play, to have traveled with this play uh, for so long and to sort of get to this point where somebody's writing an introduction saying, the 40th anniversary of, of this play. I know, I mean, it's sort of a, a blessing and a curse, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I have a friend when he, when he really wants to get under my skin, he calls me John Tamara Krasank, you know, just because <laughs> it seems to be, I, be like my legacy or something. And, you know, you, you move on and you feel like the next play and the one after are, way better and you were such an idiot back then but uh you know i mean uh, it's it's uh it's amazing that it it continues uh, and uh I, i'm always like impressed by that i think I, I was most impressed at one point like there were like i think several productions on at the same time and it was like i was counting and i go like i wrote something that 200 people now have jobs, you know? It's like, not to me, it was sort of like the government can't do that. Like that just came out of somebody's head or something. So that was probably the most impressed I was with myself, I'm not with the writing itself, but just the, that you were an employment industry, you know? Uh, but uh, no, it's really, it's great to revisit. And uh, I wanted to, you know, I, I, it, it gets rewritten all the time and then, but it became, there was all these production problems trying to put the all of the changes in because you have to like follow people and it says, you know, Amelia the maid exits from the kitchen and you turn, you have to flip it to like page 250. And, and of course, if you change a line, all of those pagination is completely screwed, right? So it, it was frustrating for me not to be able to do like the latest iteration of, uh, 
Tamara, you know, so it, 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 it's more reflects of the New York production than uh, uh, other productions that we've had. But uh, I'm very excited that it's 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 out again, and it sure looks pretty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, I'm actually going to, because that actually leads me perfectly to a question I was going to ask later, but I'm going to ask it now. Um, a question I always want to ask published playwrights is, how do you want readers to experience sort of a work that was meant for the stage? You know, um, looking at Buffon, Anish, um, it, I find that with like one person plays, you know, uh, it's people sort of write it kind of or format it two different ways. Um, they either it's just sort of one block of text, like one character, and there's like quotations to indicate character changes. Um, but in Buffon, the other sort of way is to have, you know, sort of um, even though you know that everything's meant to be played by one character, it is delineated by, you know, other different characters. So, you know, when you, when we talk about the reader experience, like when they pick up the text version of the play and read in their heads, you know, do you want us to keep in mind that, you know, that this is like a one person structure or do you sort of, did you envision that people would kind of become different characters in the process of reading? The thing is, I it's published the way I wrote it. So the reason I have, you know, the different character names uh, mentioned there is because I wanted to keep in mind that I'm writing dialogue for theater. Mm. Because you can very easily slip into prose when you're writing a one-person show. So even if the same actor is performing um, dialogue in different voices from by inhabiting different characters there's still an attack there's still a conflict you know there's still a want it's not just i'm trying to create a world i'm trying to cre create texture detail because all of that is more novelistic and this was one of the main challenges i sort of had with the one person show and uh, richard rose and anand rajaram who played uh, felix in buffoon uh, they were instrumental in sort of helping me make it more muscular, take out the parts that were more novelistic. And so eventually what you're left with is something that the actor can actually play on stage that mm. is dramatic action. And I think that's the way uh, people will read it. At some point they forget and they read it as a story. And that's great too. You want them mm. to get immersed in it and then realize, oh, I'm actually reading a play. Thank you so much, Anish. I feel like that's also really good advice. You know, I'm an emerging playwright right myself, and now I'm thinking, and I'm writing a one-person show as well. And now I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should <laughs> delineate. Um, and so, uh, you know, on the sort of inverse side, John, you have this immersive show um, mm -hmm. with many different events happening at the same time. And I think you alluded to this earlier, you know, how did you arrive at the form that it became in the book? And did you want people to actually experience it as if they were going to a, uh, an actual show, like, um, you know, flip to this page? Cause I, I do believe you have sort of that instruction within the book or, you know, um, are you also open to somebody just reading it from like cover to cover? Yeah, I think you can read it. Uh, you know, it's it's the terrible thing about being the author is you can never experience the audience experience. You know, uh, so uh, I can only guess. Um, I find that the uh, when I talk to people, they they seem to like pick a character and follow one character throughout the play, uh, and then some people just read it straight through, um, and uh, you know both report back that they have satisfactory experiences you know i mean i sort of uh i started to mirror you know i i i sort of uh sometimes i, I think I, I write plays for people who hate theater you know <laughs> my 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 first play was about a poet named john cruzank who hated the theater and uh i did it for uh richard rose uh, the director he was needed a graduate you know, play to direct an original play at uh, York University. So uh, um, I, I wrote this play and I've always been interested in form. And, you know, Tamara came out of uh, literally like a, a, a drunken Sunday afternoon 
in uh, I think 1979 or something when uh, we were uh, we, we were talking Chekhov and I was saying you know the problem with Chekhov plays is like it, it's it's only when this servant comes on that like I my attention pops up and I, I want to follow the servant off because they always have the best lines and stuff and we started talking about upstairs downstairs uh, kind of structure and, and then uh, you know Richard we were saying, well, we were a small company, you know, Necessary Angel, we didn't have any money, but there was this theater festival coming up and we should try to do something big. And I suggested Casa Loma and we staggered over there just before closing time and got really excited running around the rooms about how we could, you know, set this uh, play in Casa Loma. And, um, of course, you know, they make all their money on uh, weddings and graduation parties, so they had no interest in us, but we persevered. And, you know, it really was down to Richard. I, I would have given up, but uh, he was like, no, we're going to do this no matter what. And, and in fact, we tried to do an intervention and stop the play because we got accepted into the, you know, the festival and uh, the world stage. And Dorian Clark, the designer, and myself said, like, you know, we're like six weeks away from opening. We don't have a space to do this. In. It's a complete fantasy. But he had that real, you know, it was going to happen. And we ended up, we go going, just a digression, but we go to the city of Toronto. Uh, they had a guy in charge of buildings that they owned. And it, he was l literally like a Willie Loman character. And he, he <laughs> raised, he, 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 he raised pigeons on the roof of some building and it was his last day at work and all of his hatred for everybody in the Toronto, you know, parks department or whatever was like, screw it, let's do it. And he signed all the paperwork <laughs> and he gave us the house. It was, you know, pretty uh, 11th hour kind of salvation. So, uh, you know, it was just going to run for two weeks and, uh, like any, you know, a successful Canadian play, right? Uh, but then it, it had developed a life of its own. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, your association with Richard, Anush, I think you too had worked with Richard uh, at, at the production of Buffon at Tarragon. Uh, could you, you know, what was the development process like? Was it similar? Were there pigeons involved? <laughs> <laughs> No, no pigeons involved, unfortunately, although I love that story that John just shared with us. I think it's fantastic. Um, yeah, the process was really important for me because, like I said, you know, I had, um, well, just to give you an idea of where Buffoon came from, it started out as a full length, uh, well, it, it was, there were about seven characters in a play that I had been commissioned by the National Arts Centre to write. It was called Manja Circus and the play was set in a circus and it had the seven or eight characters there. And I worked on it for many, many years until one of the characters, the clown, just literally demanded his own show. He walked off the page and said to hell with these people, I want my own show. <laughs> and it's it's a great thing when that happens because you're really being led by the character at some point. And I just had this man sort of on stage and I said, okay, all he has is a chair. Let's see what you can do with one single actor and a chair on stage, nothing else. That was the challenge for me as a playwright because I love the challenge of one person shows. I've always seen some wonderful one person shows whether it's Daniel McIver, you know, Morris Panich or Ronnie Burkett, I find that very inspiring. And so, I, over a period of years, I had this, like I said, huge chunk of, I wouldn't call it text. I mean, it was theatrical, you know, dramatic action. But then what Richard Rose and Anand Rajaram did was, you know, muscle it. Say, okay, do we really need this? Let's flip the order of this. Uh, you know, when actors perform something, uh, the minute they start tripping on the same line again and again, I know that it's a problem with the writing. You know, if it's the same thing again and again and again, and it's a very accomplished actor, then I know that there's something that needs to adjust. It needs to be simplified. So it was all about, you know, finding character and finding the humanity in, in, this, in this clown. It was all there, but, you know, you have to streamline it. You have to just take the things that are not theatrical. You have to take them out. So that was really the most important part of the process. 
And w w did you workshop it for a long time or? Not not very long actually. We did we did do a, a one week workshop. Um, I think we did a week long workshop with Richard and Anand for a while, and then we may have done a second one. I can't remember, but then we went straight into rehearsal, and that's where again a lot of it. I, I was in Vancouver, so you know they would email me at the end of the day and say, "Look, we we're thinking of you know moving this here." taking this out and that's great i i you know i you have to trust that uh, process right. I, I i like it when you know someone's you know putting some muscle massaging the play i think it's good i like working with editors when i'm writing a novel i love working with my editor so mm -hmm. it, it in fact i i feel it it adds more depth to the work yeah no i think unless you can embrace that process you know you're you're uh, you're screwed, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, arrogance is essential, I think, for 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 writers. Uh, but uh, also, you have to you'd be a team player if you're in the mm -hmm. theater or or in film. You know, uh, and it's exciting. I mean, because they bring so much to it. I, like yeah. Tamara, uh, when we were first doing it, uh, just so the audience gets this, there's like between one and nine scenes happening at the same time in an actual mansion and it's upstairs downstairs and uh, the different inhabitants of the place are running around and often i would come in rehearsals and i would see an actor like standing in the hall and i go like what are you doing here and he says well I, I don't have an entrance for two minutes so like i have to write a quick monologue for that person and often the actors themselves would be improvising and i'd come and steal it you know like uh, uh <laughs> if, if it worked i i'm, I'm going to appropriate it so that that uh, you know collaboration was so essential to this the work uh thank you both i actually had a question anush did you get to see the production in toronto and sort of the uh the differences in moving it from toronto um to vancouver and i think john tomorrow also went from uh i think toronto to i think new york uh, la then new york LA, yeah. new and you know what's the process of seeing you know um, your play moving to different locations? Does it change in, in in some ways? Oh, absolutely. I think well, I did see the the premiere production at the Tarragon, and that was a fantastic experience. I think it was one of the best premieres that I've I've ever had. I loved. It was the first time I actually watched my play every single night from the first preview until opening. You know. Uh, Sometimes what happens is I'm I'm if if a play is being produced in Toronto I'm not there the entire time, but in this case I was there every single night, and uh, it was wonderful to watch uh, the play evolve. You know Anand Rajaram is such a fantastic performer, and to just see that play evolve it's almost uh, what I love about that seeing it seven days in a row is the ritualistic nature of theatre. It's almost like a ceremony. It's almost like a ritual. You're tra you're trying. You're just doing that again and again, night after night, and suddenly it strikes fire. And thankfully, yeah. it it you know it it lit up uh, by the time we we got to opening. But when we came back to Vancouver again, completely different director, different stage. It was done at the Arts Club Theater. Lois Anderson, who I've worked with before, another fantastic director. She directed. The play, and again, having a, a female director was fantastic because you know Lois uh, spoke to my theater class the other day, and uh, she said her interest, uh, you know, as a woman, was she was interested in in Felix's mother, the flying Olga, who's a trapezist, and Aja. So she focused on the two women in in the play, and and that sort of it's interesting how each director will will bring something completely new to it the performers Kevon Koshkam Andrew McNee we had two actors because of the pandemic there were two actors who were playing Felix on all sort of alternating performances in case one team was infected we had the other team ready to go so that was it was wonderful because i got to see these two completely different performers interpret the same character and it just shows you again, like John was mentioning, you know, we bring other, when he saw people improvise, right? He sees actors improvise. I mean, it's the same thing. I saw these two very different actors um, 
not just improvise but interpret the same character and the result was completely different john did you have do you still have the similar experience after four years and seeing you know i mean with an immersive show i mean it definitely you know because it's so you know based on sometimes actors improvisation and also audience participation you know is it is it fresh every production um yeah in the case of uh, tamara it is uh uh because it it's it's so much site specific you know so you every building the timing is different you know uh in 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 new york it was done at the armory which is a huge building and and so trying to figure out the timing uh affected everything so you'd have to do a lot of rewrites just for for the building uh and uh you know and also like it, you'd be a couple of years later in your life and you're a different person and you'd be a bit embarrassed by some line or something like, uh, you know, we're talking about doing it in LA now and it's sort of like, I mean, could you actually do a show now with like this all white cast, you know, it's fascist Italy, 1927, but I still think like, I'm kind of creeped out by that, <laughs> you know? So I'm saying like, no, I think Amelia the maid, I mean, you know, uh, the Italian fascists, uh, they had colonies in Abyssinia and stuff like that. And there's no reason she, she couldn't be like Eritrean or something like that. And I could rewrite that part completely. And, you know, so I get excited. Like if you have a whole new way into this, uh, uh production and so you know i hadn't looked at the play in years and uh you know it looks like uh, this la production might might happen again and uh so i'm excited to to revisit it and you know i think you know i'm a better writer so maybe it'll improve so like it seems like on every production there's i think new possibilities or new um areas you can reach because you're engaging new artists every yeah. every time yeah no i think so i mean and it's generational too you know that sort of shift like um when when we first did this show i think uh denunzio was uh uh geza kofax and and I, he was in his 30s and he was playing like a 70 year old guy you know we used to he put egg on his face and gray up his hair and stuff and uh you know then as it, we got it became this bigger and bigger production and stuff you know you'd get age appropriate actors and things like that. So um, it, 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 you have to like adjust your game. Well, I love the fact that we've dived into both of these works, but I'm gonna pull back a little bit and maybe give some context for folks, if there's any folks who you know haven't had a chance to see them or um, uh, had read the plays yet, by the way, they're available for purchase. I'm just gonna keep showing. <laughs> <laughs> the covers. Um, when I first sort of read uh, both of these works, I was thinking about how different they seem from one another. You know, one is this beautiful one person show recently produced in Toronto and Vancouver about the Buffon son of circus folks, two acrobats who relays this tale of love, loss and fear from his prison cell. But in some ways it's very like, timeless and placeless, you know, while the other is this, you know, epic piece of immersive theater that sort of depicts the downstairs, upstairs goings on in very specifically the country home of Italy's greatest poet and war hero, Gabrielle um, D'Annunzio on January 10th and 11th, 1927 in Northern Italy. <laughs> So already, you know, um, that was first produced 40 years ago. But as I went through the works, I realized that there's actually many similar themes in both shows. Um, and one of the themes that really stood out to me um, was that both works have references to many other artworks. You know, Felix uh, from Buffon is mentored through uh, literary works. I mean, there's a really funny scene where he sort of thinks of Romeo and Juliet as some sort of model for how he should approach, you know, his love interest, Aja. Um, and, you know, uh, music, art, poetry, dance, and even the culinary arts. I think, uh, John, you had a menu in the middle of this book, you know, all right. figures prominently throughout Tamara. Um, and so I was hoping to sort of flip that on both of you and ask, you know, what were some, um, 
artistic inspirations that you know you listen to or you watch or you experience while writing these works and also um a lot of the characters in both shows are essentially artists you know what is our fascination with writing about artists you know and writing about art as oh, artists <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll, I'll start with the fascination with artists. I, I think, you know, for me, it's I, I look at how a character is wounded when I'm when I'm writing something. I ask myself, okay, what is this person's point of deep pain? You know, and unfortunately, artists somehow end up feeling more pain than they are required. <laughs> To, to feel, <laughs> I think somewhere there's a strange fascination with let me explore my own pain a bit more. Let me keep pressing that point that I should not be touching. I know it's going to cause me pain, but let me go there. Uh, but in the case of Felix, uh, you know, he doesn't start out as a as a clown. He's just a child who who's in pain because he he feels his parents aren't available, um, and and there's a sense of abandonment and loss and and that is what his um wound is and he's brought up by um, ismail one of the uh, the guy who sells uh, tickets at the circus he becomes both mother and father for felix and ismail sort of makes him learn how to read and the first book he gives him is is moby dick and uh like that you have this little kid with this massive book that he can barely hold and when i got yeah. that moment yeah it, it was fun it you know you 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 kind of want to play with the idea of literature and uh, his interpretation of Romeo and Juliet, he thought it was a self-help book, you know, <laughs> so, okay, this, this, <laughs> this is the model for love. You have to eventually, you know, and he doesn't understand, but because he's so wounded that he can't see anything and he's constantly reaching uh, for love. And I think whether you're an artist or you're not an artist, I think eventually we, we are all in pain and in some way we are all reaching for love whether we want to admit it or not, that's what we are reaching for. And, and that's what the essential uh, idea was uh, at the center of this. Uh, that's how I find my, my characters. What are we reaching for? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so beautifully done, Dinesh. It's just a wonderful, you. wonderful piece of writing. Thank you. Um, you know, for, for me, it was, uh, I guess uh, I was always interested in what is the role of the artist in society. And I mean, I, I do find that kind of funny now because uh, we are, are are met with such indifference, you know? Uh, uh, we are so marginalized uh, as to be insignificant. But when I was a kid, I mean, I certainly remember, you know, John Irving on the cover of Time Magazine and the writer was like a deal, you know? Mm -hmm. And there was this belief that you could actually write something that would change society. You know, I certainly was this very young idealist and, and uh, you know, my next play after Tamara was Prague, which is all about Charter 77. And I spent some time there, you know, uh, with uh, some of the signatories of, of the Charter and these writers like Vaclav Havel and Ivan Klima and Milan Kundera, they, uh, they just fascinated me that they had like the courage to stand up you know, and say no to the state and to stand up for freedom and stuff like that. And and then I started researching it. And then of course you come across somebody like Gabriele D'Annunzio who nobody knows who he is now. And, uh, you know, his great fear he said was that he would be remembered as an interior designer and not a poet. <laughs> and and uh, sadly it's true he's, and it's very kitsch, his, his aesthetic. But, you know, he's a guy who wrote like a new book of poetry from him in 1911 or so would sell 7 million copies. And we mm. can't imagine that, you know, and I mean, he says it I, in the show. Yeah, no, he tells you. Uh, <laughs> I, well, I, I certainly make the sales pitch for him and, and it was quite successful for him as a seducer. Uh, and uh you know, so I, I guess I, that was my original inspiration. And also, I think I remember reading, uh, you know, Graham Greene was asking about his first book, which I can't remember the title, but it was about pirates or something. And he said, you know, I had no life experience. So history was like something I could go to and steal from, you know, and like because 
and you're right. Like you're, you know, when you're like 20 or something, you don't know much. You think you know, but you don't know much. And so finding a historical period was, you know, uh, gave him all of this information and he could write about big themes and stuff mm. like that. And I remember reading that and thinking like, well, this this might be it. Also, I was a huge, huge fan of uh, Bertolucci's movies. You know, he, he did The Conformist and Last Tango in Paris in 1900. And and he he was a, a, a like, I used to sit through uh, The Conformist, like I'd watch it, like, I don't know, like, at least a dozen times or something. And uh, um, also uh, all these Italian movies had a, had a huge influence on me. And then Tamara, I, I don't actually, I'm not like a big fan of her painting, but I was kind of interested in her, like the artist, she's kind of to me like the artist who sells out. She makes society women look beautiful and uh, you know, takes the money and is all about surface. And I mean, I've always struggled with that. Like as a writer, I think I feel like uh, uh, the playwright in me is, is is a completely different person than the screenwriter, you know? I mean, screenwriting is, as some manager said to me, it's like get getting shot in the face with money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, think that's the most violent way anyone has described screenwriting. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> it, and I've to some degree you sort of uh, sell yourself, you know, when you when you uh, are writing for television, as I do, um, you're you're always uh, you you're just uh, you know. Uh, so you're you're working for you take a lot of a lot of abuse you know in theater the the it's nice to say playwrights are respected and and they actually you know when you don't want to make a change you don't have to you know in 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 screenwriting you don't have a job you know so it's a it's pretty simple uh transactional thing well speaking of you know uh artistry and <laughs> spending prolonged periods of time with artists, you know, whether it's um, in artistic work itself or on a panel right here. Um, something that also kind of uh, is interesting to me in, uh, in both of these plays is sort of like the, I guess, connection between personal relationships and freedom. Um, that, you know, so, you know, speaking about, you know, Tamara again, um, obviously, as you mentioned, John, like it's sort of set in, in the height of Italian fascism. Um, however, um, when looking sort of underneath to the characters, a lot of them are kind of tied to this space, you know, to Denunzio's home through, you know, their personal feelings for him or personal feelings for someone else who has a personal feelings for him. And also, you know, in Buffoon, you see Felix, I mean, it, it's it's sort of like, a, you know, I think it's a, it's a intrinsic question of Buffoon, whether Felix's actions are, you know, dictated by his experiences with his parents or with, you know, his own experience of that trauma. And, and so I guess what I'm saying <laughs> in a very long winded way is, is hell truly other people? You know, um, are we truly free to sort of make these choices or, you know, are we bound by, are we just continuously bound by relationships? Do we have choice within these relationships or, you know, um, or it's sort of uh, is love or lack thereof of love, um, you know, with our parents, with our lovers, with ourselves, um, like an excuse to sort of, I think, cage yourself in a way um, um I, I, I think i think free will is relative and this is something that i realized it, not in this articulate way but in, in an instinctive way as a as a kid because i grew up right opposite bombay's red light district and i was very aware of the fact that there were young women girls who were put in cages uh and the notion of freedom did not exist for them and yet 200 meters away where i lived i used to play cricket i used to fly kites i had friends and so i was always aware of an alternate reality um so the 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 idea of freedom i think is uh, we do have free will but it's all relative depending on who you are where you are 
what the antagonistic force is. You know, that's something that um, is so, so powerful, unfortunately, and it shapes us. And um, I think, you know, you, you asked whether hell is other people. Maybe, but I think hell is, is us. We, we create our own heaven and hell. I mean, I, I can choose to, to create a space over here that is peaceful and kind. And at least, like I said, is reaching for some sort of empathy or connection with other people. Or I can just get angry with all the experiences that I've had and, and just in an attempt to bring about some sort of balance, I can just spew more anger there, thinking that I'm fighting for, for balance. But what am I really contributing uh, uh, to life? It's just more anger. So th this is my own way of you know, correcting myself that, okay, I must fight for what I believe in, but there's a process, there's a quality to it that I would like to have. I'm not there. I don't know if I will ever get there, but that's what I'm, again, reaching for. So I think this notion of freedom has always been there in my um, work because in some way everyone is trapped. Would you say Felix has reached that realization, you know, as we get further, further into the play? I'm trying very hard to not spoil it. No, oh, that's okay. He's, well, the, the character's in prison at the end of the, uh, at the beginning of the play, he's in prison. And so obviously freedom is uh, one, but what does it mean to be free? Is it a physical space? In his case, it's not necessarily that. The prison mm -hmm. is not the problem for him. The prison is his past. The prison is his inability to move beyond himself. You know, he doesn't even think about other people. And so I would say at the end of that, uh, at least at times, at the end of that, he's at a point where he realizes there might be another way for me to exist and view my own past. Mm. And, and John, you have a very concrete, I think, representation of like political freedom or lack thereof. Um, but also I think there's a lot of, you know, as Anish was talking about with other characters, uh, you know, uh, and their relationships with other characters um, within Tamara. And, you know, do you, do you see as, you know, the two being kind of mirroring each other or do they contrast each other in some ways? Oh, that's interesting. I, I never thought of that. Um, I, I, I suppose I, I, I suppose they're different sides of the same coin, you know. I mean, I always look for what's the limit situation, you know, for, for like what to set up the theatrical context, you know. And it and it is, uh, you know, whether it's you know three sisters and uh, uh, or or you know the homecoming or any of these sort of classic plays. I mean, these people are sort of trapped. But they're 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 trapped by their own you know uh, uh, perceptions I suppose as Anosh was saying you know and uh, you know that's I think where where the sort of uh, theatrical gold is to be found you know uh, and sometimes when you when your plays are falling apart it's because you don't actually have that situation you know you you need to figure out the crucible you know that that they inhabit. Uh, before you can actually write something with the kind of, you know, um, uh, I don't know, passion that a uh, theatrical situation deserves. Is hell other people? Would you want to be in this country <laughs> home for two days? Like you're asking the audience to be. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if I'm the audience, I have a passport. Presumably I could get True. out. But True. uh you know, um, I should say uh, that the what was fascinating about Denunzio, he he was the one man who could have stopped Mussolini's rise to power. So he did mm. get Italy into World War One. He 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 was he had a, he, the March on Rome was actually his idea and all all of these things. So Mussolini was terrified of him, and also he, he was like a kind of groupie, like he was fascinated by the guy. And uh, I think that. Uh, you know, they said, what are you going to do about Denunzio? And he said famously, if you have a tooth that hurts, you either pull it out or fill it with gold. And uh, he basically bought Denunzio, right? He said, uh, you can have a live-in string quartet, a live-in architect, a procurus, all the cocaine you ever could want. And, uh, you know, all you have to do is keep your mouth shut and stay here. But of course, it ended in madness and drug addiction and, you know, uh, 
uh, I think that, uh, you know, that's the story of uh, the artist's nightmare, I suppose, you know, the, the path not taken. Um, I, well, thank you both so much for engaging in this highly esoteric, <laughs> esoteric conversation about free will. But um, before we get to the Q&A, and we do have some questions here, I just want to bring things back down at a more sort of molecular level. And something I really want to talk about was the importance of letter writing in both of these, uh, in both of these shows. You know, uh, there's a very important letter that Felix holds very close to his heart and is essentially the only thing left him by his mother, the flying Oga. And it was really a series of love letters between, you know, Denunzio and Tamara that really sets the events of Tamara in, a, in motion. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, what do you think is our continuing fascination with letters and letter writing, even as we move into a very digital era? You know, do you think emails and letters are essentially the same thing? Or is there something sort of more romantically provocative about the act of uh, letter writing? Anush? I, I don't think they're the same thing. I think when uh, emails for me have no emotion, no soul, at all um, you know the, uh, i just the, emailed you before yeah. <laughs> but it's a way of com it's it's a means of communication it's uh it's it's equivalent to a phone call although then a phone call there's more personal but it's still electronic what i'm trying to say is that that the minute you have a physical object like a piece of paper and you have ink i think there's a certain kind of uh i, I would like to call it magic but something human takes place in that connection because what you're writing is straight from the body mm -hmm. uh, when you're typing it's it's just something something else uh, do we have a fascination for letter writing today i don't know i don't think so i i think we've kind of it's it's a relic but uh, again people like john people like myself maybe we long for something i don't know that's why we keep reaching for these things because we feel the loss Right, you you reach for something when it's not within your reach. Hmm. I see the it's theme of reach coming up a lot mm -hmm. in you know in this conversation. Mm -hmm. John, do you long for the for the, the lost art of letter writing? Um. Well, yeah, I, I do. I mean, but I well, there's different types. I have a friend who still writes me like you know, handwritten long letters. And it, I mean, it's always a treat to get them from her. You know, uh, my, my partner is a great love letter writer. And, uh, you know, I often will find them under a pillow or open my computer and there's a note or something like that. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a sucker for that stuff. I, 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 I think you're right, uh, Anosh, that it is like directly somehow there's a fluence that is lacking in a keyboard. You know, it comes from the heart. I, you'll notice like all the writers that like are the, the big writers like Peggy Atwood or something, they write hand handwritten novels. You know, I wrote Tamara in longhand because it's like a period piece kind of, you know, and, and, it, and it felt right to that. There's something about that flow that you couldn't have done, you know, sitting at your computer, you know? Um, uh, so uh, I think each each play is is sort of different, but uh, uh, I I I I like uh, I also like the grand romantic language of the 19th century and stuff. I'm a sucker for that. There's a tremendous and the Noche has this innate lyricism in his work and stuff that feels like it's you know it's it's not it's not digitalized. It's not binary. You know, it's mm. more from his heart. So thank you. Well, thank you both so much. I, I personally have so many questions, but I'm we're going to, I think, you know, uh, we're almost till the end and we are going to end it on some audience uh, inquiries. And so we have a question from Yelly who asks, and this is a question about process, I believe, is it difficult to give your script to a director and trust that they'll do the story justice on stage? And how do you navigate that leap, you know, if there is that fear? John, I'll John. let you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a, you know, Richard Rose is my oldest and best friend. Uh, you know, I, I, 
I remember he picked me up hitchhiking in like grade nine, you know, <laughs> uh, and uh, we started talking theater in the car. Uh, and uh, so I, I know that he kind of gets me, you know, uh, but uh, uh, we, it's still tempestuous. We still have a lot of fights about uh, uh, things. Um, and I usually, you know, honestly now, I just generally defer to him, you know, because I think <laughs> he... He, it's not that he's smarter, but he's the guy. <laughs> he's the guy who has to get it into the actors, you know. Like he is the translator. So uh, uh, I realize, like I, you know how directors are. Like they they'll they'll whisper to you as an actor. They'll say like, uh, "You hate this person," and then it turns out it's a love scene. You know, like I would never understand. That's what you have to say to the actor to get them to convey love. You know, uh, and or whatever these mind games are that directors seem to be so good at. Uh, so uh, it's not. Uh, I'm quite happy to have uh, somebody interpret the work, and it's also fascinating to see. Like you think, really? I, I didn't see that at all. You know. Yeah. I, do I think you trust Richard Rose, Anish? <laughs> I think that's yes. the question. <laughs> How much do we trust Richard Rose? <laughs> No, it, it, it's been, you know, the, the thing is, uh, just what John said, you, you find the really good directors find meaning in, mm. in your work. Mm -hmm. And um, and John is absolutely right. They're the ones who will eventually make sure that the play moves and is alive on stage. So you have to sort of just understand that now your job is to make room, not just for the director, but even for you know the the, the set designer, mm -hmm. especially for the actors, for for costume, for light, for sound, you just kind of take a step back and let their soul fill the space. Um, and it's not always a, a, a wonderful process. Let me be honest about it. You know, it's uh, but it's very rewarding when it works. And uh, I I think like I know when. Uh, a director gets my work is when they say that one thing where I go, okay, that's what it means. They've understood what it means. Mm. They find they find meaning in, in something that's already there. It's already there, but in a slightly different way. They, they bring it back to you in a slightly different way. And you know that you now have a point of contact. And I think that they can interpret it through the tradition. Do you know what I mean? Like we work in isolation, but theater is a lineage and like a good director just knows the history of theater and they bring out all of these elements. You know, I remember a dramaturge I worked with years ago, Steve Petch, who's a was a playwright. Uh, and he always like, he talked to me like I was like somebody, you know, like, like, like you could actually be better than you are. You know, and and he he would relate something I had written to like big playwrights and stuff, and I was just like, seriously, oh, uh, yeah, and I would up your game, you know, like uh, I think that that because they understand the whole sort of tradition, which you know I I'm always trying to educate myself on, but I, I mean people who spend you know thousands of hours in dark re rehearsal rooms just are on a different plane than what what I can you know bring to what comes out of the page or my head. Uh, so uh, I think they're vital. Uh, thank you, John, for encapsulating my career. Thousands of hours spent in a dark rehearsal uh -huh. room. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we just have one more question. I think this will be our last question um, of the day, even though I feel like we could just keep talking about theater making forever. And uh, it's a question uh, that I think um, really strikes at the heart of what we do, which is does writing also come from a lot of personal stories or experiences. And that's from Rajesh. You know, uh, Anush, you know, you you talk about sort of back when we were having the freedom conversation about sort of your own personal feelings about, you know, free will, and, you know, and how that kind of is reflected in your work, you know, how much how much of your work is you is <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I think all of it is me. Uh, mm. but it's not autobiographical. So none of it is autobiographical, but all of it is deeply personal. Because if it's not personal, nothing's at stake. I'm compelled to work on something because it 
means something. I'm trying to find what it means. There's a chaos in there. There's a disturbance in there that I'm trying to understand. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to channel that that chaos and then put it back out there. Um, give it back to the audience. Say, okay, now you deal with this. I've fine-tuned it. Now you deal with it. There's no answer for this, but this is a concentrated form of what I was feeling. But none of it, none of that is visible in in the work. Uh, the the writer I feel has to kind of you know be way back the way we we should be with directors in rehearsals. John, have you met Tamara? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I actually did, but we didn't hire her. I didn't meet the real Tamara, no. But I, I met this, uh, the woman, I, we, we always wanted to be Tamara, but we decided we couldn't risk it because she didn't have the acting experience. But she was this larger than life figure. And uh, I, I remember when we, uh, I said, have you ever acted before? And she said, only in my private life. <laughs> and <laughs> I think uh, that, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of the question about personal experience, uh, obviously everything is, is infused with your personal experience. But one of the reasons like I was interested in theater or screenwriting and stuff is because you could sort of hide behind the mask of all these other people, you know? So um, Paul Gross is always, uh, who I write uh, a lot of stuff with for television, is always sort of beating me up about, you know, like, not doing the the great uh, this personal play that he feels that I have to write, you know, that uh, that I I am somehow uh, um, you know uh, uh, evading my responsibility to write this great play <laughs> or something, but uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I I think uh, uh, maybe those are for uh, have, are yet to come, you know. But uh, I, I I think uh, I like hiding behind the characters, I suppose. Um, and uh, it's it's somehow safe there, you know? I mean, I feel like uh, uh, it's, it's interesting, like Anusha is, is so, his, he, it's, uh, it sounds wrong if I say hard on sleeve, but it really is so heartfelt, his writing, it's quite moving, you know? Uh, and I, I tend to like write aphoristically and, and, and in a way, I think that there's a, a bit of a coldness that I have as, as a result, you know? Um, and uh, I think now I, you know, lately I find I'm sort of stripping that down, you know, like all, all of the, all of the the sort of uh, bells and whistles of youth sort of dissipate, you know. Uh, like the older you get, you just get simpler and simpler in the storytelling. And I used to hate those simple stories, and now I find that you know I gravitate towards them. You know, uh, I, I I thought art was all about complexity and stuff like that, but uh, I think it, it it there's too much distance if you do that. You you really got to work right from your heart. I think you even say in uh, Tamara um, about the beauty of a simple folk song and how that lies within the core of like, you know, some oh, of yeah, the right. So yeah, right. you were thinking about that 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to thank both of you, Anush, John, for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. And thanks to everybody for tuning in and for the beautiful questions. Uh, it's so lovely to sit even in a digital space and talk art. And it's, you know, very much a privilege. So thank you I'm so hard. much. My Dias pleasure. Bro. It's great to meet you. Great thanks, John. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to echo Angela's thanks to you all for this fantastic conversation, your insights about your new works and creative process. And thank you, Angela, for leading such a dynamic discussion this morning. Yeah. It's truly been a joy to listen to you all. Uh, and yes, thanks also to Diaspora Dialogues for staging this event of their talk symposium with us this morning. You can catch two more exciting events presented by Diaspora Dialogues at Watts next weekend. And yes, thank you everyone who, for uh, tuning in from home. Uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy of any of the books uh, discussed in today's panel, please visit our official bookseller for this event, Another Story Bookshop, or our official ebook and audiobook sponsor, Rakuten and Kobo. You have until the final day of the festival to sign up for our giveaway in partnership with Rakuten Kobo. Visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca slash 2021-festival-contest for your chance to win one of three special prizes, including a new Kobo e-reader. Remember, for each day of the festival you tune in, we'll announce one bonus entry code. Today's entry code is Alliance. 
Make sure to tune in later today to our panel with the KEW Writers Alliance, Oral Storytelling. That's at 1 p.m. with Bashar Lulu Jabor, Carolee Waking, and Sarah Gransku, and Tenille Warren. Later this afternoon, we will be, we will be joined by Aaron Bowe, E.K. Johnston, Mariam Pirabai, Tannis McDonald, and Caroline Topperman for another KW Writers Alliance panel at Writers on Reading, and that's at 3 p.m. For more information about this year's lineup, as well as the panelists you've heard today, visit our website, toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. If you'd like to support The Word on the Street and the work we do by making a donation, simply head to our website and click Donate Now at the top of the homepage. So thanks again for joining us and have a great day. <laughs>